Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Point five. Sunday morning with Dan Brown. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. And welcome to Sunday morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning, a day of hope, a day of compassion, and a day built totally around love. Again, you're listening to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on 95.5 WPG Talk Radio. Thank you for tuning in this morning, and as always, we appreciate you taking the time to listen to our program. Going over eight years, really happy about being able to do that for such a nice length of time. And what keeps me on the air Um, is you guys, all of you listening, all of your questions and comments and the ratings that you have been able to give this program over the years that we've been on. And many of you had followed me on the Saturday mornings where we used to be an hour earlier. So welcome to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown at 7 a.m. here on Sunday morning. If you have any questions about today's program or maybe a program from the past, or a subject that you'd like to hear discussed, please contact me at Sunday Morning Dan Brown at Yahoo.com. That's Sunday Morning Dan Brown at Yahoo.com. And if you would like a free Bible, it's a, a modern version, it's a hardcover. If you would like a free Bible, please to that email address, Sunday Morning Dan Brown at Yahoo.com, send me your name and your address, and I will send you a Bible free of charge. And um, all I ask is that you wear out the pages. So again, welcome to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown, this fine Easter Sunday morning. And I pray that today, as it should have been really all week, when we think about something that took place, world-changing, life-changing, universe-changing event that took place more than 2,000 years ago, approximately around this time and this day. And that is the death on Friday and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, on Sunday. I think there's moments in time when all of the sudden something happens and everything changes. There's so many examples that I'd like to share that it's almost hard to to pick. It really, really is. You know, we're sitting here and we're thinking about how things are really bad and how things can change. Um, It's amazing uh, the changes that have taken place around us, but there is something that has been consistent for these thousands of years since this most miraculous event had taken place, an event based 100% in love for humanity. When all of a sudden, in a moment, everything changes. That's a powerful reality for you and I. And I'm here to tell you that that empty tomb on Sunday morning, those thousands of years ago, the fact that the tomb is empty changes everything. Not only for you and I as individuals, but who we are, how we live, and even why we live, and the way we live. And I want you to understand that God's work cannot be stopped. Man has tried over and over and over again. So crazy things have we done. From the time when the Tower of Babel was built to the the individual who stood on top trying to shoot an arrow into the heavens. Kind of crazy. Always trying to stop something that God was doing. 
But Jesus, the Pharisees, the chief priests back in our Savior's time, there was a lot of issues. Some of it we can equate kind of today, and maybe it's not that good of example, but certainly I think if you step back and just look at some things that you've seen in the news, it is almost like Democrats and Republicans today. They just don't get along. They can't seem to find common ground anymore where they can work together. Jesus was believed offensive to the chief priests and the Pharisees of the day because they thought and felt, and rightly so, he was the son of God. So their authority was undermined. Where at one point in their history, they were looked up to. The Bible talks about them being given to high places and the, the prominent chair at the table, looked up to, you know, venerated almost. And the reality was, was the Son of God was on the face of the earth. God in human form and representation was walking among us for some very, very special, special purpose. They felt that he was subversive to their power, although all he ever did was what? Preach love. Showed them the path of their short ways and their offensive ways of how they treated humanity. Think about that. Everything about Christ's ministry bothered them. Everything. Everything made them angry. Because he was telling the truth and he was showing the difference between godly and holy, an opposer, a pretender, someone who went through the motions. As the scripture said, their lips honor me, but their hearts are far from me. Again, everything about his ministry bothered them. The fact that he liked and ate and hung out with tax collectors, according to them, he was hanging out with immoral, you know, immoral harlots, prostitutes, and the uneducated people flocked to him. Why? Because as uneducated as they were, they could see in reality who the Pharisees were. What did he say? You lay heavy burdens upon the people, yet you don't lift one finger to help them. Isn't that something? I want you to think about that. He hung with tax collectors. He ate dinner. He had a hard lip use her hair to massage and oil into his skin and prepare for his death and burial. To the religious people of that day, the people that Jesus walked among were blemishes to them, and they were tired of Jesus because what were the people doing? They were flocking to him because they saw genuine love and compassion, not someone looking down at the end of their nose at someone who they thought was beneath them. They wanted this thing with Jesus to be over. They remember when he was still alive and he was going to be resurrected from the grave. So what did they do? They go to Pilate. I think it's very interesting to note that the people of the de- of that day weren't allowed to use their own military. They'd been under Roman rule for a number of decades by that time. And so they had to go ask permission. So they go to Pilate and they say, listen, can you secure this burial tomb for us? We don't want the Jesus' disciples to come and steal him. Now, what I believe and what I think the scriptures is telling us in the teaching is very, very clearly that no matter what they did, no matter how many guards they placed, you cannot stop God's work. You cannot stop the work of God. The chief priests and the Pharisees, they all wanted to make sure that Jesus couldn't be resurrected from the grave. 
and they thought we're going to make a plan and there's absolutely no way, even if he comes alive, that he's going to be able to get out of that grave. And of course, they made up the excuse that, um, you know, that disciples might come and steal his body. But you have to remember that so many of the miracles that Christ performed while he walked among us, raising the dead more than one time, making the blind see and the deaf hear, curing incurable diseases, telling a lame man to get up, pick up your mat and walk, time after time after time, casting demonic forces that had possessed individuals for practically their whole life. They wanted this plan to be stopped. And again, I think it's important that we remember that we cannot stop the work of God. Sometimes I think we try to do it by accident. I think we do. Not on purpose, but we kind of veer away. We want to grab that wheel again and steer our lives in our own directions. And there are things going on around you and I, circumstances in our lives, and situations where God wants you and I to bear fruit. And this is important. He said you will know them by their fruits. And that fruit that we bear is how the people know that you're real. They knew that Jesus wanted the Son of God by the fruits that he bore of compassion and faith. Feeding 5,000. And that was just the men because they didn't count the women and the children back then. In a way, we're always putting our proverbial foot down and saying, "Mm, no, Lord, you're not going to do that. But that's a mistake on our part. When we miss what God is trying to do in our lives and try to alter the direction that God is pushing pushing us in. That's why one of the most common ideas in the Bible is the idea of surrender or trust. And many of us know what it's like to resist what God is doing in our lives. God will lay out a clear path, and we will just take detours. But just like the Pharisees and the chief priests, we say, God, this is unacceptable in my plans. I plan to do this, work like this, buy this, live here, do that. Instead of surrendering to God's will so that his will can be accomplished in our life. And for the Pharisees and the chief priests of the day, Christ was unacceptable to their plans. So they were trying every which way they could to stop what God was doing. I want you to notice that in the in the verse where it talks about Jesus being brought to Pilate and the Pharisees trying to say, you know, this is why you have to do this. This is why we need the guards. And they they essentially said to him, to Pilate, let's not let this happen so that the last deception will be worse than the first. If the body was to disappear or the body was to become resurrected. And they're saying this to Pilate, listen, listen to this. And the first deception that Jesus told the people was that he was the Messiah. This is what they're telling Pilate. And they don't believe he's the Messiah. All of the things that he did amongst them, that they stood there and witnessed, and they refused to accept the truth that their eyes and their ears were telling and showing them, hearing it, hearing it. That's really bad. But I'll tell you what can be worse. If his disciples come and say he's resurrected from the grave, they're telling Pilate, this is going to be a huge problem from us, you know, for us. Can you take care of this Pilate? Now, notice what Pilate says. He says, you have a guard. Go you, go your way. Go on. you got guards. Make it secure yourself. Now, I don't think it's by chance this is a precursor for what happens next because in verse 66 it says they went, they made the the tomb secure, they sealed the stone, they set the guard, (laughs) they put a huge rock in the way. Oh, my gosh. It was 
incredible the amount of things they did to prevent the change, to stop this. I want you to think about that for a few minutes, all the things that we do and push in a way to prevent what God has chosen should take place. You're listening to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. We'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. South Jersey's talk station, WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Do you love a good cigar? Mike Rowe here with a radical idea. If you want to see more companies make more things in this country, buy more things from more companies who make things in this country. I refer in this case to the incredible t-shirts, sweatshirts, blue jeans, and more made by my friends at American Giant. Everything American Giant makes is made in the United States. And right now, you can take 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com slash Mike. That's American-Giant.com slash Mike. Sunday morning with Dan Brown. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. South Jersey's talk station. And welcome back to Sunday morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Welcome this fine Sunday Easter morning, and as always, we truly appreciate you taking the time to tune in and listen to our program. Our program entitled today is You Can't Stop This. What a great uh, title for an Easter program (laughs) about how people work so hard to stop the events that happened today. We know that Jesus was crucified on Friday and raised Today, three days later, as promised, as predicted, all throughout the entire Old and New Testament, verse after verse after verse, saying what would happen to the Son of God would happen to the Savior on our behalf. So I welcome you back to the second segment of today. You can't stop this. And the the scripture where I'm taking most of this from is from Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, and if, when you get a chance, I would read the entire account from Friday, from the Last Supper, you know, on Thursday to Friday, through, through it all. I would take the time and read the scriptures and contemplate and pray as you read those. But here we're having something today is uh, they're trying to alter God's will. So in Matthew 27, verses 62 to 65 and 66... It essentially says this, the next day, this is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gather before Pilate. They're coming to have a conversation with him. And they said, sir, remember how we said that that imposter, he, he said that while he was still alive, after three days, he was going to rise again. And therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him lest his disciples go and steal him. You know, I think that's uh, very important to see that what they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to prevent. And uh, that's those are the verses that were going around for this Sunday message. And again, they said they wanted to make sure that the last deception, if it happened, if he, if he rose, it would be worse than the first deception, which was his claim to be the Messiah. And he refused and said, go place your own guards there. And so the stone was rolled in front of the door. And unlike today where people are buried in the ground at a graveyard or cremated, it's, it was a different kind of a thing back then. This was a, a cave that was a huge rock in front of it. And so there was a physical barrier. There was a physical obstacle, a huge rock to the resurrection of Jesus. Or so they hoped, so they hoped, and so they thought. And that was their purpose. And then secondly, they sealed it. Now, the idea of sealing showed the political authority of Pilate saying, um, this is all right that we seal the tomb. And so the politics of the day uh, said Jesus is not coming out of this tomb. That was what was happening there. This was official announcement. And then third, the guards are set. 
So not only is there the physical obstacle, the political obstacle, but now there is a good old fashioned personal obstacle, physical guards with swords and weapons. And what happens really is this is a setup for Resurrection Sunday. They are doing the best they can to to stop God at what he's doing and the work of God. And in Matthew 28, we see those obstacles don't work. And this is the classic account of the resurrection. And the simplest way to say he is risen. And although there's these obstacles, there's this big stone, there's the seal of Pilate, there's the guards. But they're not going to stop what God's doing. Nothing is going to stop or prevent God's will from being accomplished. And so after the Sabbath, on the first day of the week at dawn, um, as you're following the tradition, the Jewish tradition is from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And it's in that day after sundown on Saturday that you really don't do anything. So this is Sunday morning, and at dawn we have Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. They're coming to see the tomb. They want to see what happened, what's take place. And it's interesting that another one of the gospel writers tells us that they had brought anointing spices. It was interesting. They weren't coming to see a resurrected Jesus. They didn't really quite understand that. They were coming to anoint the body of a dead one. And they didn't realize that Joseph of Arimathea had tried to take care of it, hastily and properly burying Jesus until they got there. So these women were not coming to see a risen Savior. They show up, but in verse 2, things got real. There was an earthquake. And a heavenly messenger of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon it. I don't know how many of you have ever felt an earthquake or been in an earthquake. I've felt some small tremors. It's not pleasant, and it's kind of scary. And uh, I remember some years ago standing in City Hall in Atlantic City up on the upper floors, and we had an earthquake, and the building was moving and it was shaken and um, now here there's an angel at the tomb and he just rolls away the door his face it says is his face is like lightning but what does he do he just sits down on top of it I mean seriously you got to love that angel and uh, you don't ever think about an angel having swag but I suppose they do he just plops down and the, the guards shook with fear And they became like dead men, it says. They were frozen in their tracks. They couldn't move. Now, notice what the angel says to the women. Here's what he says. Don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. But he's not here, for he has risen. And he said, Jesus told the people he was going to be resurrected from the grave. And now I realize today, Easter Sunday, there's a lot of people who are thinking, You know what? I just don't believe that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. But you know what? Me personally and many other people like me have real reasons that we do believe. And many people have real reasons not to believe. Think about who can believe that Jesus was dead and he came back to life. If you seriously recount and see the miracles that Jesus did and understand that the God of all creation, nothing is impossible as Jesus himself was raising the dead. So I realize how some people can believe that's a legitimate argument and struggle with it. I do. I get it. But I held that argument and I've always believed as from a young boy that Jesus rose from the grave. I really, really do. I think about all the objections to the things said in the Bible. It's easy. All the things that uh, happen and reasons that people do not want to go on to accept what happens. But what happens after this is something very, very exciting. 
And I want you to make sure that we all realize that our faith would have never even got off the ground 2,000 years ago if they just produced a body. When all this starts going on, he's resurrected from the grave. And all they had to do was say, no, no, his body's right here. But look, and that's not what took place because he wasn't there. The stone was removed, and he was risen just like he said. Now, what happens next is so, so exciting. Because you notice that the angel says to Mary and the other Mary, come and see. Go and tell. And I think this is important reality for us, that all of us need to come and see that Jesus is resurrected. We need to have that visualization and realization that Jesus is resurrected and alive and sits at the right hand of the Father. And then when we have that realization, we need to go and tell, right? We need to go and tell. We sing songs about it. They're good songs. And we listen to the band play, the praise team. But the talking head sometimes in front of us, after a while, is the word. But we need to visualize it. The pastor is there giving us direction, but the pastor is not the Messiah. And we need to not get lost in that and venerate all of those who are teachers and instructors to a position and a pedestal that we just cannot stand upon. And I think it's important because a lot of reasons, a lot of people don't like to even come to church sometimes. Is We forget that the pastors are people like you and I. And then we begin to look for the flaws. And so the idea of me saying to you this is look at Christ. Know that Jesus is risen. And then you will be led into the way of life. You're listening to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. And we'll be right back after this. Stay tuned. In a world full of fake news, AI, and unverified information on social media, where can you get the latest, most accurate South Jersey news? WPG Talk Radio 95.5 and the WPG Talk Radio app. Don't wait for the newspaper to come in the mail. The WPG Talk Radio app is updated around the clock from New Jersey's largest radio news team. Accurate, dependable, reliable. When you need to know, it's WPG Talk Radio 95.5 and the WPG Talk Radio app. News. I'm Deborah Valentine. Israel and Hamas set to restart peace talks today after passage of a U.N. resolution for a ceasefire. Fox's Lucas Tomlinson reports. White House, there's no question, wants to see uh, some peace talks and have the war stopped. But of course, the Israelis are saying, what about those 100-plus hostages that Hamas still keeps? The U.S. abstained from the U.N. vote, angering Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. A three-ship convoy has left a port in Cyprus to deliver 400 tons of food and other supplies to war-torn Gaza. Pope Francis celebrating East Easter Sunday Mass in St. Peter's Square in Rome, the pontiff through an interpreter. Almighty God, cleanse us of our sins and through the celebration of this Eucharist, make us worthy to share at the table of his kingdom. The 87-year-old pontiff's health issues caused him to miss Good Friday services. America's listening to Fox News. Your WPG Talk Radio 95.5 AccuWeather forecast for South Jersey. For today, nice with times of clouds and sun with a high of 66. For tonight, plenty of clouds with periods of rain towards dawn with a low of 47. For tomorrow, considerable cloudiness and cooler with steady rain becoming intermittent with a high of 55. For tomorrow night, cloudy and evening shower in spots followed by periods of rain late with a low of 45. I'm AccuWeather's Caitlin Lawrence on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. WPG Talk Radio 95.5. And welcome back to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. Thank you for tuning in and listening. If you have any questions about today's program or program uh, question from the past or something that you'd like to hear me talk about in the future, please contact me at Sunday Morning Dan Brown 
at yahoo.com. Again, thank you for tuning in today's program. We're in our third segment of the day, and our program is called You Can't Stop This. Almost sounds like a song, but it is in reality that you cannot stop the hand of God and the work that God has started. And where we left off in the second segment, I was talking about a lot of people become disillusioned uh, with coming to church, and that's a shame. But most of the time, the disillusion becomes in their dissatisfaction with what they they think they should be saying, what they think they should be hearing, and not what the spirit-led pastor is sharing. We often fall into the place of where we venerate those that are teaching us because God provides them with great speech and voices that move us. And then when we see a flaw, we're so quick, quick to fly in on it and hone in on it and dig it apart and use it as a reason not to continue to fellowship. I want you to be aware that you need to fellowship and you need to hold yourself to a Bible-believing church. But don't lift the pastor to a position that he's impossible for him to fill. There is only one Savior. There is only one perfect person. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who hung on that cross for one single purpose, to reunite humanity, to free us of the sin, the generational, the inherited sin that was placed upon humanity from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. And so I I want you to really think about coming to church regularly. And... um, I think it really, really is important for you to come to church. And when you do, rather than, you know, thinking about, oh, I've heard that all that before. Here we are again, the same sermon packaged differently with some movie title or some fancy way to engage me. But then it is the same thing. And the reality is it's not the same thing unless you mean the message of love of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the same thing. And that we're commissioned to preach unto the ends of the earth over and over, as long as it takes and as much energy that it takes. So you see, there's a dual reality when you come and see. And oft times as pastors, we're really good at saying come to church rather than saying let's come together so we can have a profound experience with the reality of the resurrection, because that's what we want to do. And we want to see you join God's story in this generation. Because sometimes we got to say a little more, that it's just not good enough to come and see the lights in the band. We've got to engage so deeply. And I know many, many, many wonderful pastors who pour their lives into And I want to give kudos to those pastors and the pastor's wives. Oh, my. (laughs) The pastor's wives who have to be there and and be such a strength. And um, I know many pastor's wives who are tremendous speakers as well. And I just want to say thank you to all of those pastors that I know, pastor's wives, pastor's children, who endlessly share the gospel, and have devoted their life and service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And where we're heading now is, as we continue this story, the angel doesn't say, listen, Mary and Mary, the tomb is empty. I got some folding chairs for you and some Arnold Palmers. Come on, sit down. He's not saying, I got some sandwiches and relax. No, the angel says, come and see. They see and he says, now go tell the disciples that this is all really happening. Then they start going and they were excited. And all of a sudden Jesus shows up. He says, rejoice, rejoice. And they start worshiping. But then what he said, what does he say? Does he say, let's all hang out and hug and sing Kumbaya forever? No, there is work to be done. He's going to be transformed into heaven. 
He doesn't say that. He says, now go and tell my disciples to go in to Galilee, and I'm going to go and show myself to them. He's going to be seen over and over and over to confirm that their dead body that was placed in that tomb on Friday is alive and walking among us on Sunday. We come and we see that you and I can have profound experiences with the reality of the resurrected Jesus. That is what is important to each of us. That is what we seek on a weekly, daily, whenever you're studying the scriptures. Your whole purpose in studying the scriptures is a relationship with Christ. Not knowing every scripture, that's wonderful you can do that. But if you mix the relationship for the reading, you're going to miss that heavenly boat. Once we have the experience, we need to go and join God's story in the world. Coming to church only feels fulfilling when we also simultaneously join God's story in the world. If you only listen in the pew or the chair, you're not fulfilling what God has called you to do. So I want to encourage you. That's what I try to do week after week. I want to encourage you. And at the same time, I want to challenge you because there's nothing more fulfilling than after you have a profound experience with the resurrected Jesus than to put on that faith and be part of of the changing the world, changing the world in Jesus' name. That is what is important. And that's where all the stuff gets worked out into reality. I mean, I can bore you with stories forever of people, including myself, who found God saying, listen, I want you to join me and I want you to serve kids and I want you to serve students and I want you to serve people on the on the margins. I want you to serve business leaders who have everything but feel lost inside. And when you find yourself in the story of God, not only coming and seeing but going and telling, then all of a sudden you get, oh, this is why we come to church. Because it's a family reunion. And then we scatter. It's to gather and then we scatter throughout the world, blessing people in Jesus' name. That's what we do. For some of us, for some of you, you absolutely love Jesus and you've been following Jesus. And for some of us as God's people, we come and we don't serve. And all we do is watch everyone else serving and then think that we're supposed to be like American idol judges of how well they're serving. Ooh, um, it could, that could strike a nerve because you know exactly what I mean. It's not healthy, is it? That's not what we're doing. Never. That's not what we're trying to do. And sometimes you'd rather be the singer than trying to be the guy sitting there picking on the people who were trying. No, we want to serve alongside of each other. We want to accomplish God's will. And how did Mary and Mary respond? They were both terrified and overwhelmed with joy at the same time. They were tearful, they were crying, and they were filled with joy. And when Jesus sees them, he says, rejoice. And then he says, don't be afraid. So this Resurrection Sunday, this morning that you're listening, I believe that Jesus is going to counsel you. Both of us, you and I in the same way. First, don't be afraid. We all know what it's like to be filled with fear because we all have it. As much as we try to say we don't. Could we be just honest about that? Because every one of us struggles with some kind of fear. And why do we struggle with fear? The word fear <laughs> means false expectations appearing real. Oh, how do you like that definition? But see, the reason that you and I struggle 
with fear is because we think we understand what tomorrow's going to hold. So we have expectations. The problem is it's false. And I can share that with you in my own life and the passing of my wife. One day she was here and one day she was gone. And reality came that things changed. It did not go as I expected it to go. So our struggles with fear are real because there's just so many things that are out of our control. There's certain things that you cannot say, this is going to be the day of my last breath. You don't know. This is going to be the day that I retire because a million things are going to happen, unexpected things, so we have fear. But Jesus tells us, don't be afraid, rejoice. You're listening to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. We'll be right back after this. Please stay tuned. Sunday Morning with Dan Brown, WPG Talk Radio 95.5 and the WPG Talk Radio app. Jenkins is. When everyone's on the same page, getting things done at work is easy. No matter what you do or what industry you're in, how you communicate is key. Everything you type is equally important to collaboration. And Grammarly can help. Think of it as your AI writing partner, empowering you to communicate effectively and efficiently so you can make a bigger impact in the workplace. 96% of Grammarly users say it helps them craft more impactful writing. And as the gold standard of responsible AI, Grammarly is your secure AI writing partner that allows your team to make their point and move faster. By understanding your writing and context, Grammarly provides relevant, personalized suggestions. And with tone suggestions, you can navigate even the most difficult work conversations. You can also save time from spending hours editing drafts to just seconds with one click. Sign up and download Grammarly for free at Grammarly.com slash podcast. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Easier said, done. W-P-G. Talk Radio 95.5. And welcome back to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. My, the time goes by quickly. Welcome to the fourth and final segment of this Easter Sunday program. And as always, I appreciate you tuning in and taking the time to listen to our program. I also would be remiss if I did not thank you uh, for your comments, your questions. Um, they're always wonderful. They're always lovely to read and see. And I'm so happy to be able to respond back and forth with all of you that respond and uh, write in. And if you would like a free Bible, please send your name and your address to me at the email of Sunday morning Dan Brown at yahoo.com. And I will mail you a free Bible free of charge. And my only request would be that you wear out the pages. Again, Welcome back to our fourth segment of this fine Easter Sunday morning. The title of our program is You Can't Stop This. And so where we left off was talking about our lives, how we can't affect change and we have expectations. But moment by moment, day by day, things can change completely. And when we rely on ourselves and our own expectations, we are just headed down the tracks of disappointment. I want to assure you and share with you that the presence of Christ in your life will change your fear to joy. And joy is not situational. It's not circumstantial. Joy is a disposition of the heart that says, God, you are God and I trust you. Think about that. It is giving up ourselves, our will, and trusting in God. He gives us so many examples about uh, us being like little children. And, and so the little children trust that the parent, the guardian, has only the best intentions and the best, best things for them, that wants to give them everything, to guard them and protect them from everything. And so that is what our Father in heaven does for us. It is amazing what God does. I know there's many of us that are racked with fear. Absolutely. You've, you've 
written me so many times, many of you, and I, my heart breaks for you, my prayers are for you, that you are racked in fear. But I want to share with you that in the same way you choose fear, you can choose. That's what life is about. It is our choice. There are times when things are pressed upon us out of our will, but God sees. And when you reach to God, when you reach out to your Savior, he will hear. Reach out with a pure heart, with all sincerity. He says he will answer. We're racked with fear. Again, in the same way you choose fear, you can choose trust. Trust in God and rejoice. And from a believer's perspective, you and I, with joy, walking together in faith, in this path of faith that we've chosen, we can walk with joy. And when we do that, it is the best testimony of the finished work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hate to even say this, but a grumpy believer is a part of the problem. We should rejoice with unimaginable amounts of joy because he has risen. Think about that. It's something. In this 21st century, we realize, at least in the West here, that men and women are equal but different. I hope that's truly realized, but women are equally intelligent to men. And sometimes, in my opinion, maybe more so. Women have the same skills, although unique. And there's a uniqueness. But men and women are not equal. But in Jesus' culture, in the Roman culture, women weren't even allowed to testify in court. And I know that sounds crazy and archaic, and it is crazy and archaic. Because we don't value that. But still, in that day, those women were not allowed to testify. But what's amazing for you and I, and especially sometimes for those of you who are skeptics about the Bible, you think, oh, this is just some crazy wives' tale about the women. But I do truly believe there is a reason that Jesus revealed himself to these women first. They loved him with all their heart. Absolutely did. And the men froze and fled in fear, hiding in the homes. So if you're going to tell the story that Jesus is the resurrected Messiah and you want to run forth, you have to make sure that you stare, you stare this down intently. And share that these women testified of the resurrection. You must do that. These women were there and Jesus said to them, to them, listen, you go tell my boys I'm alive. (laughs) I just think it is absolutely incredible and amazing. I think that. There are some of you who've been spending every ounce of your energy not to deal with the fact that the tomb is indeed empty. If Jesus did conquer the death, then we should have to deal with him. I want you to not miss the fact that your ambivalence to dealing with Jesus is still dealing with Jesus the same. God has created each one of us to deal with Jesus. And the most important question in the world is, what have you done with Jesus? And what's interesting about that question is that if Jesus is who he said he is, the only proper response is absolute allegiance. Because truthfully, if he conquered death, he's the only one who's ever done that. I'd say that's pretty powerful. The one teacher in history, the one philosopher, the one religious leader who is alive today, not just another dead one. I want to encourage you today 
If you're listening to me and you've never made a decision to align your life with the giver and the sustainer of life, if he conquered the grave, you want to join him in that. If he conquered shame and brokenness, you want to join him in that. So do I. It's the only logical place to be, and that's with Jesus. And I'm here to tell you because I know what happens. You say that and someone says, well, God will never accept me the way I am. And I will tell you he accepts you exactly the way you are and exactly where you are. If anyone else is telling you that you need to perform some kind of miracle on your own for you to know Christ, they're not telling you the truth. They're laying heavy burdens on you the same way the scribes and the Pharisees and religious leaders did in Jesus' time. And you see where that got them. They are all dead and dust, and Jesus lives. And those who tried to stop God's work were not successful. And Jesus rose on the third day. He showed himself to hundreds of people. But those two, those two lovely women first who loved him so, so much. And he honored them in that way to be very special. He accepts you. He accepts you. He accepts you exactly where you are and how you are right now. Because he is the change. If you had the ability to make the change, the cross would not be necessary. But it was necessary because we are shattered and broken and sinful. But you know what's awesome about God? He loves us so much and too much to keep us the way we are. He's changing all of us. We never arrive in this life. We're all in the process. It's just a matter of if we're going to say, God, I am willing to let you do the work you want to do on me from the inside, not the outside. I'm going to let you move in and change my life from the inside. And I will tell you, God is not afraid of where you've been. He knows you better than he know, than you know yourself. It's not about where you've been. It's about where you're going. And what you'll find that if you turn to Jesus today, you are going to find that he's already been waiting for you to turn and come to him. So today I ask you, just come. Come and see him. I want to God bless you all this beautiful Easter morning and tell you, pray and ask God to come into your life. Thank you for listening to Sunday Morning with Dan Brown here on WPG Talk Radio 95.5. God bless you all. It's time for another season of The Palmetto Porch, an original podcast from Discover South Carolina. I'm Devin Whitmire. Join me as I get to the heart of what makes South Carolina such a great place to visit by speaking to the locals who make it so special. Premiering December 5th, find The Palmetto Porch wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about our show, visit scpalmettoporch.com.